Um, all right, conformity, we've already talked about the ash conformity test. Um, you know, it's a survival technique. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of years of be a part of the group or die. And it comes out in this, you know, it comes out in the ash conformity test with this line. So 76% conformed with the group, even though the group said the wrong answer. <clears throat> Obedience, again, we've talked about this before, the Milgram experiment. Um, people will kill other people if a person of authority says to do so. So that's what, that's what this whole experiment was about. There's a movie about it. It's really good. Um, all right, helping behavior, John Darley and Bib Latane. Uh, so contemporary American social psychologists who are best known for the pioneering study of bystander intervention in emergency situations. So know the difference between these two things right here, altruism and pro-social behavior. Altruism is literally doing something because it's the right thing to do. Right? You're helping somebody because it is, it is the right thing to do. And then pro-social behavior could be altruism, but it also could be self-serving. So you see and you hear about these wealthy people donating to certain causes. That's great. It's really good behavior. It, it, you know, it's not necessarily altruistic. It could be pro-social behavior because what really happens is they get a tax break from this. Right? The government's going to take their money no matter what, but if they give it to other people and to causes that could probably that they think that should have their money, um, they get a tax break from it. And the government doesn't take that money. They actually just give it to somebody else who probably needs it. That would be pro-social behavior because there is some sort of self-serving thing going on there. Um, okay, factors that increase the likelihood of bystanders helping. So let's say somebody's hurt, you're a bystander, you're just around. Um, okay, when would you help? The feel good, do good effect, so feeling good equals doing good, get a gift, give a gift. If you feel pretty good, you might help this person out. Uh, feeling guilty, uh, it's your fault that something bad happens, so you do something to help. Um, Maybe, you know, something happened where it was kind of your fault, so you decide to help the person who is in trouble. Uh, seeing others who are willing to help, like a blood drive, if you, like, see people actually doing this thing, you might be more willing to do it. Uh, perceiving the other person as deserving help, so giving money to someone who claims that their wallet had been stolen. Uh, knowing how to help, so knowing where to volunteer. And then a personalized relationship. A personalized relationship with a person who needs help, uh, that's the dangerous one because you might help them a lot. You, you might help them so much that it hurts you. Um, all right, factors that decrease the likelihood of bystanders helping. Um, this is known as the bystander effect, so a phenomenon in which the greater number of people present, the less likely each individual is to help someone in distress. The more people that are there, the less likely that people are going to help. The reason being this thing called diffusion of responsibility. So this is a phenomenon in which the presence of other people makes it less likely uh, that an individual will help in distress because the obligation to intervene is shared among the onlookers. When you drive by a recent a wreck that just happened, everybody's rubbernecking, everybody's looking, and guess what? Nobody's calling 911 because everybody assumes that somebody already did. And that's just how it goes. That is the diffusion of responsibility. There's this case, right, with Kitty Genovese. This girl got killed in New York City. 37 people heard her screams for help. No one called the cops. Everybody else thought somebody else already did. Being in a big city or very small town would decrease the likelihood of you helping somebody. Vague or ambiguous situations, so you're not certain that, you know, help is needed. I mean, I've heard stories in New York where people are just stepping over somebody um, and they step over them all day because they think they're just homeless and in the street, but in actuality, they are dead. Um, and then when the personal cost for helping outweighs the benefits. Could I die if I help this person? That's an interesting situation to think about. Um, all right, uh, a couple things right, right quick and then we'll be done. Uh, so social loafing, the tendency to uh, expend less effort on a task when a group, uh, when in a group. Um, so, okay, boom, it's college. You get assigned to this random group where you don't know anybody. 
Uh, you'll meet a social loafer in that situation, that's for sure. Somebody who's not going to pull their weight, somebody who's going to do absolutely nothing, and other people are going to have to take um, on their responsibilities. Then there's social facilitation, which is unbelievable. So the tendency to, for the presence of other people to enhance individual performance. I am down with this. Show me what you got, right? Um, you know, I think we went over this thing called self-determination theory. Uh, and one of those things um, that is super important is competence. And when you're in a group, you want to show your competence, right? You want to show you're competent in the situation. You want to give uh, as much as other people are giving. You want to give more. Um, so that's social facilitation, stepping up to the occasion whenever you're in a group setting. Then we have de-individuation, which is when you have a reduction of awareness in a group setting. I mean, a lot of people think that riots kind of happen uh, because of this type of thinking. Um, and then groupthink, a uh, psychological, psychological ph phenomenon that occurs when it, within a group of people in which the desire for harmony or conformity in the group results in an irrational or dysfunctional decision-making outcome. Again, riots. Uh, and then finally, persuasion. Uh, I think you know what that is. Uh, here's some forms of persuasion. Uh, foot in the door phenomenon is when you ask for something small and then you ask for something great. So uh, I want to go, uh, can I go eat at Johnny Susie's house tonight? And your mom or dad says, yeah, sure. And then you get over there and you call up your mom or dad and, they, and then you say, can I spend the night over here? That's foot in the door phenomenon. Asking for something small and then asking for something big. Door in the face is ask for something huge and then ask for something small. So, uh, you know, can I get $100? No. All right, can I get a dollar? Yeah, okay. That's door in the face. Uh, and then uh, the final one, norms of reciprocity. So um, people tend to think that when someone does something nice for them, they ought to do something in return. So that's pretty much what it is. Um, well, we're done with unit nine. There we go.